All right, we're up. Carrie Ann Payne, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I am very well. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Now, listen, uh, where are you coming from? I am in London at the moment. It's sunny today, which is nice because we've had very, very boring weather for the last well, few months, to be honest. But it's been very grey, so I'm delighted to see some sunshine. Now, you, you, you've you lived in London for how many years now? Been in London for four and a half years now, pretty much. Okay, nice, nice. I was reading about you have a, like a super interesting background. You're actually born in South Africa to British parents. And then from what I could read, you were spotted <laughs> at a very young age by an Australian coach, um, Bill Sweetenham. Is that correct? Like at age eight, he spotted you and, and tried yeah. to recruit you to come out to live in England? There's a little bit of truth to that. Wikipedia is always quite an interesting one. There is definitely right. a bit of truth to that. So my parents um, were from the UK and they moved over to South Africa when they got married in the 80s. No, early 70s, somewhere in there. So my brother, my sister and myself all born out there, lived there 25 years. And I was on a training camp like... Um, I'd been picked as 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 had loads of other swimmers been picked for this training camp, which was like a bright futures type scenario. Mm -hmm. And Bill Sweetenham had come over and he was like consulting, I guess, um, on that specific thing. And yeah, he kind of spoke to my parents, realized they were British, and he said to them, "You guys should consider, you know, for her career. Not that he was kind of saying definitely go, but." you know, consider maybe going back to the UK because the prospects that I might have would be better here um, than they were in South Africa, which is an interesting thing for him to have said. And I was about eight, maybe 10, somewhere around that that age group to, um, I guess, for him to have seen that. So there is a bit of truth in that, but he certainly, you know, I, I've, I've known Bill and, and I've known him for a long time um, anyway. So he wasn't the reason we moved back uh, from mm. South Africa to the UK. But yeah, there is definitely a bit of truth in that. That makes sense, but even even still, just being in a select group at at such a young age, like even even if you were ten years old, let's say, to be in a select group and then have Bill Sweetenham's eyes on you at that age, I mean, you must have been pretty talented. Uh, to be honest, I knew nothing about it. I just I went where my parents took me. I absolutely loved swimming, and if anything that they wanted to take me to that involved swimming, I was there. It didn't matter what it was, where it was. Um, I just loved it so much. So. I don't think I ever really felt the pressure because I was the youngest of three. So my brother was pretty good. My sister was pretty good. So I just kind of assumed I'd follow their footsteps and they were swimming. So I carried on swimming. So I think it was a bit of a learning curve for everyone. And I guess my parents were a bit like, oh, she's been invited to this thing. That's quite cool. Mm. And I was just like, yes, I get to swim all weekend again. <laughs> it honestly is all that I can remember of, of that time. Um, but it probably wasn't until I moved to the UK that I, I was 13 then that I kind of realized that I, it wasn't just, you know, a normal thing, which is what I guess my swimming journey was, was you do this, you make it to this competition, you do this competition, you win medals, you win medals here, you go to this competition. Um, it wasn't until I came to the UK that I realized that that isn't everyone's journey. Well, you didn't move to the UK for swimming, but was there any thought in where you guys were going to live based on swimming? Not, not so much, but I do remember my dad actually, um, <laughs> It's, it's funny, I guess when you come to the UK sometimes and you're moving, or, you know, when you're moving around at clubs and things, you, you know, the coach would like to have a conversation with swimmers to make sure that they're a fit. And I do distinctly remember my coach when we moved to the UK telling me that my dad was actually interviewing him <laughs> to see whether he was going to be a good fit for me, which I think is quite amusing. But, you know, I, I guess my parents were quite protective of me when we moved, but we didn't really have a choice of the, the city that we moved to. It was more the club within the the surrounding area. So it was Manchester that we moved to, moved to. And there was a couple of clubs in the area. So my dad kind of just reached out to all of them. And then we settled because he moved over three, four months before we did. So he mm -hmm. then settled on the coach that I ended up um, having for the first two years while I lived here. And, and I couldn't have been happier. He was such a great coach. Manchester, what year was that? 2001. 2001. Okay, so I swam in the Manchester Commonwealth Games. That thing back there, that's my little medal. Um, what was that, 2002, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. That was a fun Commonwealth Games. Do you remember it at all or not? I remember going to watch. Um, I was obviously too young to have even, or not even possible for me to have, have qualified or anything, but I do remember going and watching. And Oh, you did? I did you watch the 50 freestyle? I did not watch the TV star. Oh, maybe I did. I can't really remember. Sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. A little, it was a, you know, back. You didn't dream of being a sprinter? 
Uh, I think everyone dreams of being a sprinter, right? <laughs> Especially the ones that turn out to be 10K swimmers. We dream. That's what I dream about now still. That I could be a sprinter. Yeah, exactly. Well, in terms of um, your race selections at that age, what, what events were you swimming? Because I know eventually you, you do end up swimming kind of some IMs, but is that kind of where you were at that age? So I was swimming when I was that age, when I moved over, there was two two races essentially that I was um, that I thought were my races. One was the 400 freestyle, um, which I guess probably was more of the inclination of where I was going to go to. And the other was actually a 100 fly. So mm. I was um, the number one 13 year old, I guess, in South Africa for a 100 fly. And I don't really think I ever properly beat that, that PB that I set myself when I was 13, which was a 103, which I was pretty happy to be honest I'd be really happy if I could get any close to 103 for 100 fly now um but yeah that was definitely one of the the, the races I thought was the one for me um sadly though sprinting was not to be in my um swimming journey from now well I just think the gods that I, the distance swimming was never in mind because I saw the work that <laughs> you guys were putting in on the other side of the pool and it was just not something that I could handle but so there's a lot of K's so so who who's your first coach when you, when you get there? You said for a couple of years. So his name was Dave Crouch, and he actually um, coached. Um, oh, you've really put me on the spot now. This is going to be so bad. I hope he's not listening to for me to. Yeah, there was a breaststroker who who was an Olympian. Might have won an Olympic medal for breaststroke in the eighties. Not many of those in Britain. James it wasn't James Gibson. No. No, earlier, earlier than day, I, the name will come back to me. Um, and he had another distance swimmer who was very promising. She went out to America, though, at the time. But yeah, Dave Crouch um, has had a huge amount of experience coaching, started from a learn to swim program and then created his own kind of um, old, like age group program, I guess. Um, and that's where I was training with him. And I would have definitely stayed with him for a bit longer. It was just the training pools that were the issue. So I was training in a 25 yard pool. Uh, or a 33 and a third meter. And I was doing distance swimming by that point. So by the time it came round to, um, you know, needing long course meters to train in long course meters for the competitions I was racing in, we could see that that was an area of improvement that I really was lacking in. Um, mm. And that's when I looked for another club that had access to a 50 meter swimming pool. All right. So then who'd you move to? So from there, I moved to um, a coach called Sean Kelly who um, has had many Olympic medalists um, in his squad. So it was called Stockport Metro and we were based out of South Manchester. So he had Steve Parry, who won a bronze medal in 2004, mm -hmm. the 200 butterfly, um, Graham Smith, who he was part of the training squad for. He won a bronze medal in Atlanta for the 1500 freestyle, I think. I think it was Atlanta. That's okay. Um, so you don't, you don't need to remember their bios. They're okay. They'll, they'll be fine. <laughs> well, these guys are my friends, so I need to make sure. <laughs> And then my training partner, Cassie Patton, she won a bronze in the same race that I did in Beijing for the, the 10K. Um, yeah. Right. So we have dreams of swimming at the Olympics in the pool, I'm sure. When did the, the thoughts of swimming open water start? It definitely found me, if I'm completely honest. I, you know, the thought of going from an 800, so knowing that I was already the one in the pool for the longest, swimming the longest event, um, going from that to a 10K was definitely an adjustment period for sure. Um, and that's, so I had um, my career, if you like, went from 400s and it very quickly into 800s. And as a junior, I, you know, it was a very promising career. And then as I got a little bit older and not because I, I slowed down or anything necessarily, I just, um, I was just a little bit behind where the world was going. So it, I was doing PVs and I was getting really close to qualifying times, so but just kept missing them. So it was, um, I just missed out. So I did the time two weeks too late to make the Athens Olympics at the age of 15 for the 800. I missed it at the trials, did the time two weeks later. Um, could have been for many different reasons. Then the next year was the World Championships and the World Champs the year after and Olympics are always really fast. I did something like an eight second PB um, and missed out by, by 0.4 of a second. So I was so close to making that team and but just missed out. Um, and then it was the Commonwealth Games the year after that, where which was out in Melbourne. Um, I made that, which was amazing. And I had a wonderful experience apart from my race. I have always, and I'm sure to this day, will still always be nervous for any race or any event that I do. 
ever. It was my first real major senior competition. There was like 17,000 people in the stands watching. Um, and I wasn't nervous, which still to this day, I can't tell you why I wasn't nervous. Um, but I just wasn't nervous for some reason. And I didn't really have a great race. There was a whole bunch of stuff happening, I think, personally and, um, and other stuff that maybe just my mind wasn't quite in it. So I came fourth, which, you know, I think for most athletes, when you step away from your career for a few years and you say, um, I came fourth, everyone else goes, wow, that's amazing. But in the world that you're in, you're like fourth. And I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. That really sucks. You, said, um, you said that was Melbourne 2006? Yes. Okay. So that, that was my last meet. So we actually swam in a meet together. There we go. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was such an amazing Commonwealth Games. I really loved the mm. whole experience again. Apart from my race um on the but i came fourth and um yeah there was i was one of two on the england team that didn't win a medal at that that competition the other one was mark foster um which i'm sure you would have raced that against maybe at that commonwealth games I beat mark foster at that yeah, I know you did because he was the only one they were the only two that didn't win medals um so it was all just a bit a bit too much to handle to be honest um not to handle that's maybe not quite i just wasn't enjoying training, which was weird because my childhood was just swimming. I love it. I only ever want to be at swimming and training with my friends. So um, I had a couple of dark months, I'd say, um, where I didn't really know any different from swimming. Swimming was my life. And I think if I didn't have, if I didn't, if I wasn't that way inclined, I, I probably could have quit, I guess. Um, but I didn't, so I kind of pushed on. And my coach eventually, Sean, was just like, right, something needs to change. And I think he could see that there was a real potential for me in the in the 10K. Um, but I was a bit resistant, <laughs> like I said, to go from an 800 to a 10K. So eight yeah. and a half to two hours is a massive jump. Yeah. Um, so he gave, gave me an ultimatum, which essentially was, right, you can either go out to Sheffield or not out. You can go to Sheffield and you can race a 400 medley. And that's the, the focus that we decide to go on is in the pool is just the 400 medleys and we see how we get on. Or you can go to Australia. And to be honest, all I heard was Australia. I didn't hear anything else. Um, and do a 10K. And I thought, yep, B, option B. Let's go with option B. And uh, and that was the start of it, really. So I had to, I went to that competition. Then I had to qualify for the World Championships, which was back out in Melbourne in 2007, mm. which um, was kind of the start of the, the World Championship process to qualify for um, Beijing in 2008, which was the inaugural 10K for the Olympic program. So that was the first time it had been in the Olympic program. So we, he, I think he could see, without trying to force me down that route, he could see that that's where, you know, an avenue for me that could be a successful one um, could take me, but didn't force me down. And I'm really glad he didn't force me down that route and I eventually chose it um, myself. We individualize training in the pool, so why not individualize your nutrition? Erica Barney of Barney Wellness Building will help you and your swimmers get exactly what each athlete needs through genetic testing and personalized nutrition plans. So stop guessing what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. Athletes within a few weeks have noticed they're recovering faster because they're fueling their body with what they need and staying away from what their body hates. Erica understands swimming. She gets it. She's worked with over 20 Olympians, including the fastest man in the world, Caleb Dressel. Group discounts are available, so go to Biney Wellness Building and get in touch with Erica today. That's Biney, B-E-I-N-E, wellnessbuilding.net. It seems like this is kind of the early days of open water swimming, even though we're only talking about 07, 08 type thing, you know, it being in the Olympic Games for the first time. Um, you know, what were the training strategies back then i imagine it's just all right let, we're going to swim for two hours so let's just do as, as much volume as we can was that kind of the strategy there was potential for that to be the strategy and we knew a little bit about what some of the other athletes were doing and um, so i knew that some athletes were doing like 100k weeks week mm. in week out week in week out and i knew that i couldn't sustain that i knew for two reasons one is um, that's just where my body's limit was. It just, for me, I couldn't quite do the ultra marathons, the 35 Ks or 25 Ks. My body just didn't, maybe it's because I didn't want to do those. <laughs> that was a step too far, but I just couldn't handle injury wise, illness wise to keep hitting those really high volumes. I think it's because the second reason was 
I was still really, really keen to have those racing skills, to have the fire, to be able to swim, you know, to change my pace. And I think when I started doing the longer distances, the reason I was getting injured was because I was still trying to maintain speed and endurance. And it's, it's just not, it just wasn't possible um, for, for me as an athlete at the time. And it was almost like we had to make a choice between do we just go down and you just become the most kind of efficient, you know, endurance athlete, or do we try and balance it? And that's where we decided to go for balancing it. So my distance didn't really change that much. I guess the thing that did change was the focus, if you like, of some of the sessions. So, you know, my heart rate sessions or the cardiovascular sessions, we used to do like, you know, your bog standard 3100s. They used to be about getting almost as fast as I could for 3100s, where in the end they kind of changed to, you know, hitting a specific time, which was, you know, slightly slower than as fast as I could go. But it was about maintaining the heart rate. How low could I get my heart rate at that that period of time? And we probably swim those types of sets a bit longer. So, so a few more times than we would have done in a normal kind of 800 program, if that makes sense. So we kind of did a bit of a merge between between the two so that we could maintain the endurance, but also the speed at the same time. Yeah. Well, uh, talk to me about your experience in Beijing. You end up getting the silver medal. I want to talk about that. And then I want to kind of ask you some specific questions about open water swimming. Give me a little bit of a clinic. But in terms of your experience in Beijing, you get second. How many... 10Ks had you swum before winning that silver medal? I really hadn't swum many. I think I'd probably swam maybe eight or nine um, in the lead up to that being, you know, I think that was my 10th ever 10K, which, you know, now looking back on the, the sport, there's so much to do with um, experience. And that's where a lot of the, you know, the older athletes tend to do a lot better. Um, in that region is because they have so much experience in in racing and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later um but going into that i was ranked eighth in the world so the way you qualify for the 10k and this is still the case is you have to come top 10 at the world championships the year before to qualify mm. for your spot and then there's a top-up event of the top nine and then they give out the um the, con the continent spots after that so maximum of 25 people per race um, and if you wanted two people, so you're allowed two people per country, but the only way for two people to qualify was to both be top 10 at the world championships the year before. That's the only mm. way you could have them qualify. So actually the world championships for me almost was my Olympics because my training partner, um, came away from that world championships in silver, in silver medal positions. She was second. So she had some really good success, um, in that. And I was like, I have to be in the top 10 to make this Olympic mm -hmm. team. Because yeah. I was, you know, the presumption that was that Cassie was going to make it. So the only way I was going to do it was to be in the top 10. And I came eighth and I was delighted. But I was still young, still learning, um, you know, 16, 17, 18, around, around about that time. And then going into Beijing, I just remember sitting with my coach the night before going, I've got nothing to lose. I genuinely don't. I didn't know whether I was going to make it to another Olympic Games. I, um, you know, I not only qualified for the 10K, but I had also qualified for the 200 and the 400 medley in the pool the week before, which mm. was a total bonus, was not expecting that at all. Um, and then I just thought I've got nothing to lose. So why didn't I just go out from the start and see what happens? I knew I had the endurance because I trained really well. And I knew on paper, I was the fastest 800 swimmer um, bar Cassie of the whole field. So I knew that I had the speed to be able to, to kind of do that last little bit. And, and it worked out really well. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> everyone needed to know that. Yep. That's all right. You got you got kids in the back. I got dogs in the back. It's all happening. <laughs> it's normal. That's all right. Um, well, the the strategy then, I guess, to to end up getting on the podium. Um, I mean, it's one thing to think, oh, I'm just going to go for it, but then you've got 10k to figure out here. So you obviously had some sort of plan going in that you had kind of stuck to. Yeah, so it was, it literally was, um, if I'm being completely honest, my race strategy at the time, I'd come from the pool into the open water. I wasn't the biggest fan of the conflict, not going to lie. Still not a big fan of the conflict that happens. What do you mean by conflict? So imagine a little bit like rugby, but in the water. Right, right. <laughs> um, there's close contact. You don't have lanes. You don't have, you know, your own. technically contact isn't allowed. Um, but it happens, you know, nine times out of 10, it's totally accidental. Someone swims into you, you get a hand in the face, um, that kind of stuff. You know, there is the odd occasion where things, you know, there's there's the one or two athletes who are not 
good to swim next to so you just avoid them at all costs but yeah there is definitely a little bit of the contact and, and conflict that happens especially going around boys um mm. usually where most of the issues sort of happen broken noses black eyes scratches all all that kind of stuff really wow yeah <laughs> yeah sounds like water polo a little bit not as violent that's why i didn't say water polo because it's not quite as violent yeah so i wasn't i wasn't and had never been a big fan of being in the middle of the pack so part of the reason why i was like i've got nothing to lose i don't really like being in the back there so i'm just gonna lead and that's what i thought you know i don't have any that was that i don't have anything to lose by using this race strategy i know i'm the fastest down I knew I was the fastest down the last 200. So on paper, I was the quickest of overall for 200 meters. And I thought if I can get to that last 200 meters, having not used up all of my energy in the 10K and lead up to that, I'm in a real good position to finish the last 200 really fast. Um, and that's, so that was my race strategy was to try and lead the swim as much as possible. If someone wanted to try and beat me, they had to pass me down the last bit. Um, and, and that was my race strategy. And I didn't realize it at the time, but my training partner had exactly the same conversation with my coach. So he kind of knew separately that this was our race plan. Um, and we both had the same race plan essentially, which was to just go out from the front. So it looks like we were, you know, in, in tandem in team, you know, having this conversation, we weren't actually. So it was quite funny at the beginning of the swim, it took about a thousand meters for us both to kind of ease into the fact that this was going to be the race strategy and this is how it was going to go. We were going to be side by side for the whole of the 10 K. Um, and that's pretty much what happened <laughs> during this. Oh, really? Wow. So yeah. you guys had the same coach and, and you didn't know that you're on the same page. So the coach was kind of in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> why, <laughs> why didn't he just say, well, hang on, you both got the same strategy. Why don't you just work together? Um, I guess because he, I guess he just didn't want to put us, you know, that's not a strategy that we had ever talked about or used before. So the thought of combining us at the time and saying, you know, the night before, literally the night before the event going, why don't you guys work together? I guess it was a, a risk that he just decided not to take. And he just thought he'd You didn't seen. like each other? We did. <laughs> we definitely <laughs> did. It was, it was new. It was really new. Right, right. As I guess, so was this race strategy for, for both of us. But we were both, yeah, just kind of quite new to the to the process, and um, I, I guess maybe he didn't know how we would how it would yeah. pan out for both of us. Swim Angelfish, Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Well, um, let's talk about um, a little bit of some clinic type stuff here for open water. You can educate me a bit because I imagine, let's start with breathing. I imagine the breathing in the pool is different than breathing in the open water because you've got to deal with wind and waves and stuff so what's the the deal with how to breathe um, when you're swimming open water so the process is is as you can imagine just the same it just depends on things like waves and sun essentially those mm -hmm. are the two things that might affect someone's breathing pattern so mm -hmm. if you can only breathe one way it becomes a bit of an issue in the open water so i'd always recommend that people learn how to breathe both sides it doesn't mean that you have to be a bilateral breather all the time, but it just means that you have the skill to be able to breathe the other way. So say if waves are coming out and you just constantly get mouthfuls of water, mm -hmm. most of what swims are salty swims anyway. So the last thing you want is to be taking in loads of salt water or if the sun, the glare of the sun is just blinding you every time mm -hmm. you breathe one way. So being able to breathe the other side, is really helpful from those perspectives, but then also from a racing perspective, being able to breathe both sides also gives you a much clearer idea of where everyone else is in the in the race um mm -hmm. a bit like in a pool you know if, if your main competitor is two or three lanes down the side and you only breathe to one side you find a, a, a point in the race that you if you need to check to check where they are um so it's a really good skill to be able to breathe both sides but it's um it's not necessary um but like i said it's, it's really helpful if you've got waves right. hitting you for sure, absolutely. Now, um, what about sighting? I imagine lifting your head constantly is slower. You do, you wouldn't want to do that in the pool. So, um, how do you 
how do you sight and then how do you train for that as well? Yeah, so sighting is, is a huge deal. As I'd say I always get asked what, you know, how, how, how should I change my front crawl? You wouldn't change your front crawl when it comes to open water. There's a few things that might affect that. But the thing that does change is that you have to get used to sighting. And the act of sighting is literally lifting your head above the water. Now, what happens to our bodies when we lift our heads up, essentially, is that the back of our body um, sinks down. So the higher your head comes out, the more impact that's going to have on your body, which means the more you know, water you're going to drag through, it's going to be harder. So that kind of water polo stroke, so head out the water doing water polo is kind of the worst thing to do for an event anyway, from a safety perspective. Mm. If you really need to see something, you know, maybe there's some jet skis around or something like that, then that's the best form of sighting. But it is going to have a lot of take a lot of energy from you to lift your head out that much of your body out. Um, so essentially, the main thing when it comes to sighting is to try and lift the head up as little as possible. So I always think this term is not the best for open water, but we kind of call it crocodile eyes. <laughs> mm. So you're just literally trying to lift your eyes out of the water. And so we're minimizing yeah. that as much as possible. But again, you know, crocodile, crocodile eyes. I usually get some raised eyebrows when I mention that word when we talk about open water. Today. No, it makes sense. To, totally. How, do you add that into your pool training? Yes. So I would, you know, a month before any kind of major 10K, I would be practicing that in training. So it'd be like a drill. So if you're doing a set of drills or um, doing like some long swimming, every sort of, you know, fourth or fifth 50 would be sighting. So it'd be lifting my head up, getting used to that. So that because the, the effect that it has is um, depending on which side you breathe most mostly on. But the mm -hmm. act of lifting your head up is triggered by the arm in front of you. And if you know anything about injuries with swimming, it's usually the complete opposite thing that ends up hurting. So because I was more of a left side breather and I'd use my right arm as the, the lean to, my left hip flexor would be ruined after a 10K, especially if I haven't done one for ages. So it was just about getting my body used to that in the lead up to um, swims and then just practicing, making sure I could sight on the other arm as well. Has there ever been a race you were in where you lost sight where you just couldn't figure out where you were? No, I was, I'm really lucky with that. Um, I have this like internal GPS beacon system. Um, so basically like there's like this beep, 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 beep that goes off in my head if I'm off course. Um, the only time I've ever allowed myself to go off course was because um, I wanted to stick with the pack. So that's the other, I mean, there's many things you have to think about. If the leader of the pack is going off course, you have to make the call. Do I, you know, splinter off from the pack and go on mm. course? Or do I stick with the pack because they might come back onto it? But this particular swim, and I don't want to scare people off, but this particular swim was my first swim um, in Hong Kong. And it was a place called Repulse Bay that we used to swim. And it was beautiful. But I remember standing there for the first time. Um, there was this amazing water temple. And it was just beautiful, like incredible. And um, seeing some boys to the right-hand side. And then the boys for our race were kind of out in front of us. And I was asking, why are there boys here? And what's all this stuff? And they're like, oh, yeah, don't worry about those. They're just the shark nets. Oh, and I was like, oh. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> they're, they're, the, they're the shark nets over here. So why are we swimming over there? And like, oh, don't worry, we haven't had a shark attack for about seven years. And I was like, uh-uh, seven years not long enough for me and that swim specifically i wanted to make sure i was in the pack for most of that which is completely ridiculous because it was it was my job to be honest to swim and to win races but on that particular swim i do remember my brain going we're off course we're off course but i don't care i'm gonna stick with everyone for yeah i don't blame you at all i'm staying with the pack <laughs> Jeez. yeah that is scary i mean I, I grew up in australia and you i mean you spent time in south africa so you know all about sharks but um yeah, I, I did many in open water that I was thinking to myself, I'm gone. I'm going to get eaten. I'm going to get eaten. It's just the worst thought to have when you can't really see what's going on underneath you and you just have thoughts of sharks attacking you. Jaws has definitely ruined it for me, for sure. I'm never going to let my daughter watch Jaws. Not until she's old, much, much older, and she loves the sea. Definitely. Well, I didn't need Jaws. Like Growing up in Australia, the shark alarms would go off all the time. We'd always have shark spotters on the beach and the alarms would go off and be like, oh, God, another <laughs> shark. But so it was, it was always a threat for us. But um, oh, that's crazy. Well, tell me about the, uh, the eating and the feeding. Uh, you call it feeding, I believe. So to, um, yeah. why is that necessary? When do you do it? Um, and what effect does it have? 
So this is really interesting because I don't actually think that there's been that many studies really, really done on this. This is one mm -hmm. of those, this is what's been done. So we'll mm -hmm. just continue to do it. So you learn yeah. from previous years and the previous years. Um, but essentially, because we're swimming for two hours and we're, you know, the, the slowest we'd be swimming on a 10K would be anywhere from a 110 to 112 pace. Um, and then we would push it anywhere down to 105, 103, depending on, and that's the girls, the boys would be kind of similar. So, you know, pushing close to what some 1500s, really good pool 1500 swimmers and 800 swimmers would be doing the last sort of 1,000, 2,000 meters of the swim. Mm -hmm. So we are pushing ourselves quite a lot. So mm -hmm. the feeding essentially is just taking on some carbohydrates during the swim for the end part to make sure we have the energy in our body for the end which is why our training was all based around making that 110, 112 pace as easy as possible. Like how easy could we make that? How easy, how, how much of a, um, or how, like how much taxing is that going to take for us if we swam, you know, that pace for, for two hours. And that's what training was mainly about from that perspective. But when the feed came through, it was literally just, um, gel so just you know those gel packs that you see just in water especially if we're in salty water you just sometimes needed something to just clear your mouth out but essentially it'd be a gel pack or some sports drink or something electrolyte drink um in some water and there's usually a feeding station so you don't always get chance to pick where it is because there's usually one station on the course that a coach or a team manager or someone would be on um, and it does look a bit ridiculous, if I'm completely honest, because essentially you can imagine 20 to 30 men and women standing on a pontoon with what looked like fishing rods. And that's pretty much what it was. They were, you know, how stable they could be fishing rods. And on the end of the fishing rod was like a cone or a, a, like a bucket that had the drink in it. And so they would have to kind of navigate these fishing rods with a bunch of athletes coming underneath, trying not to hit swimmers, um, making sure your swimmer got to you. So how you could shout the loudest to make sure your swimmer got to you. And then essentially you take on a carbohydrate drink, that, that drink or whatever it was at that point. Um, that was one version of it. The other version was if you could be what we call self-sufficient. So if you could carry them on you. So mm. I used to wear the open back suits um, for this reason specifically. So I used to I used to carry two in the back of my swimsuit and then I had more control over when I took them. So the feeding station can be a real strategy point. Um, and if you don't need to go in the feeding station, especially if it's just off course, that's when you can make some gains or catch up or you know get in front of the pack um, quite significantly if you don't need to go in in that, in that position. So if you can feed at a different point of the swim, it usually gives you a bit more opportunity from a tactical perspective, not mm. to kind of have to go in and do that. Um, and generally the 10 Ks would be sort of four loops of two and a half K and the feeding station would be on that loop at some point. So most people tend not to do it for the first um, two and a half K, but wherever it is on the second, third, and then depending on the fourth lap, how close to the end it was. So if the feeding station was close to the start of the fourth lap, then you'd probably find a lot of people going into it. But if it was close to the end, no one would go in on the last lap. Um, just because, again, like I said, from a tactical advantage, um, you wouldn't want to be off course for that last part. Yeah. Is it absolutely necessary at some point to do it? Or can you get through a race without doing it? Yeah, interesting. This is the point I was trying to make before was I don't think there's been enough studies done on it to know whether you can you can survive, whether a, an athlete can make it through that whole no swim. No one's tried? No one's just tried to be like, you know what, this time we're not, we're not eating this time. I guess they have done and it just depends on on many different things. I think if you, I thinking about it now, probably could have practiced it during training a bit more because I, you know, you can replicate a two, two hour swim at those sorts of conditions um it was almost sometimes like is it worth it or not and then on the other hand it was if you could go in and it was totally fine to go in you may as well um if it didn't you know interfere or, or right. anything race in the strategy you may as well just go in mm -hmm. um if you wanted. so yeah it was a, it's a really interesting one i'm i'm not i bet it's probably changed even since i retired which was in 2017 uh, this probably the strategy's probably changed again do you keep an eye on the current, um, you know, open water events? I did until I had a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's quite tricky um, to keep track of that when you've got to keep track of feeding schedules and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, um, so yeah. I haven't in, in recent um, years, but actually my, my main focus now is more on coaching coaches. So I'm still involved in the world of open water. 
um, but it's not in the elite section of it. It's more in the mass participation section. That's where my kind of passion lies. Um, but I do try and keep my eye on, on the British team anyway when they do open water swims. Event, heat, lane, name of swimmer, times and places. It's called Swim Nerd Live, and it allows the data and times from your actual scoreboard to be broadcast and viewed in real time on any smart TV, phone, or other device. There are so many things you can do with this software. A very simple and easy to use necessity for any team or facility that is live streaming their meets results. One click on any device and they're watching your swim meet live in real time. Go to swimpractice.com to learn more. Um, talk to me about the, the pack itself. Um, obviously, there's a strategy to either be in the front of the pack, be in the middle, be at the back, be at the side. Um, you know, in swimming, when, when you're training, when you're on someone's feet, you're, you're just getting pulled along. You're, you're getting taken for a ride, you know, which is nice, but it's super annoying for the, for the person that's in front. Um, <laughs> but that can be tactical as well. So what's, what's the strategy when it comes to the pack itself? So there's a couple different strategies. So my original strategy was, I don't want anything to do with it. Don't want to go anywhere near it. And it worked really, really well for me for many years. So it worked well in Beijing. Um, the girl that won the swim, Larissa Ilchenko, the Russian swimmer, she is an outstanding swimmer. And she had she was something like 19 times world champion in the lead up to that swim. And she had all the experience she could imagine. And just, you know, she totally, nailed the race strategy so you just sat on our feet the whole way and then just pinged mm. past us the last bit so i i'm not upset at all about that's where i was inexperienced and i came away with silver medal i was you know really delighted with that performance right. i did vow never for that for that to never happen again essentially <laughs> um and and kind of learned from that bit so there is a strategy of leading from the front but because the um the world of open water swimming has evolved so many times and there's so many more pool swimmers now really fast pool swimmers coming from the pool into the open water gone are the days where you can really do that now because everyone is much faster everyone you know the the sport has changed it's really changing people to swim much much faster gone are the days where you can you know aim to lead all the whole of the 10k mm. that's not really possible anymore in the men or the women's races actually um, so the next strategy then is basically trying to, um, now there's, it's again, interesting because different people that have had success have done this in different ways. So some of the success comes from the guys that basically just take the first lap as easy as possible. They sit at the back of the pack and this, I'm talking about, um, you know, people that have won Olympic medals mm -hmm. started races at the back of the pack because they just thought. I've got the time, you know, it's the first half hour, I'm going to make this as easy as possible. And they're like, really cruising, just unbelievably slow. their stroke rate is so slow, they're putting in no effort, because the pack is pulling them along. The risk that you run with that, though, is if someone breaks off or the pack, a pack breaks off, and then you have to catch them up and you have to waste the energy that you conserved trying to catch them up. So most people tend to sit in the middle towards the top end of the pack. So again, you're getting the benefit of people in front of you towing you along. You're not the one at the front wasting the most energy, um, but you're aware of what's happening. So you can see what's happening. What comes with that though, is then you're right in the middle of the pack, you're in it. You know, there's people around you, there's people in front of you, people behind you, people next to you. If you're in the middle and there's people on either side, they can't see there's someone on the other side. So they might bump into you and then you bump into the next person and so on and so forth. So it can be a little bit, you know, it's a real skill in itself to be able to swim in the pack and, and maintain your own space. And that took a long time for me to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and the strategy that I needed to have in place, because I was so scared of getting hit that I was just like, oh no, don't hit me. And then I'd get mm -hmm. hit until I eventually, mm -hmm. the thing that worked for me, which was after the, the London Olympics actually, I um, I had a judo lesson from a friend of mine who at the time was a great idea. She's like, yeah, I'll give you a lesson. Don't worry about it. Until I was stood on the mat looking at who was the current Olympic silver medalist for her particular <laughs> event. And I was going, what have I done? What have I done? This is a really bad idea. And I spent essentially spent 45 minutes being pinned to the ground. Um, but what I did learn was that I can handle it. If I can handle it on you know, in person on a mat, I can totally 
own my own space. And that's what I learned. So owning your own space is definitely the best tactic to use in those scenarios. So maybe elbows a bit wider. That's when your water polo training can come in handy mm. perspective. Or then the final one is leading from the front and hoping that you win. Um, but there are very few people who can do that these days. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I was I was thinking that of like, just get out in front and go, but um, that must must be tough over two hours, you know, dragging yeah. people because, because you know, we know in the pool, when, when you're out in front, someone's just on your feet, they're just getting a ride. But the, the worst, you know, one of my pet peeves is when someone is on your feet, are you allowed to touch the feet of your competitor? Yeah, yeah. So it's really hard to stop that from happening. Um, I hate that. I want to kick someone in the face when they touch my feet. And I was the same. I was totally the same. And I'd get so angry and annoyed at people touching my feet that I would mm. kick and I would waste energy and I'd be like, stop, mm -hmm. touch my feet. And they were like, I don't know what you want me to do because there's someone behind me touching my feet and someone behind <laughs> her touching her feet. And you might think a bit less of me now for this particular tactic, but actually what I did see was that that was a potential tactic and I knew how much it annoyed me. And when I got over that and then kind of went forward um, and then started, <laughs> I guess, using that tactic on others because I knew that it would annoy them, it just meant that they were wasting so much like emotional energy that would waste a lot of physical energy as well. Um, so yeah, towards like, you know, for the last eight years of my career, it really didn't bother me that I was touching people's feet. And in fact, I sometimes actively did it because I knew it would Oh, no, listen, listen, i got to tell you, I got made fun of all the time for, for being a sprinter and being weak or, you know, soft or whatever it was. So my strategy in practice sometimes was those distance swimmers. I'd be like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you a lesson. So I'd use my speed to stay on their feet for the first couple of hundred of whatever we were doing in practice. Now we just play with their feet just to piss them off, you know. Like you, you're not, you're not better than me. I can touch you. I can stay with you. I can do whatever I want, and I can get. And then, you know, once it got to a point where I just couldn't hang with them anymore, I'd back off. But by then, they'd be so pissed off that I just knew yeah. I could get under their skin. So it's definitely a strategy. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I love it. Um, well, what about what have the, what have What's been the evolution and what's been the biggest evolution? You said a lot of pool swimmers are coming in now, a lot of, you know, fast. And that's what we're seeing is a lot, a lot of these top 1500 meter guys and girls are getting on the podium in the 10 Ks. Is, is that part of the evolution? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, the, the first part of the evolution when it became an Olympic event was that we had loads more faster pool swimmers coming in to the 10K, which really completely revolutionized it. And it meant that at the time we were able to lead from the front and still finish from the front as well, because we had the endurance, but also the speed and that balance between the two. And we saw that in Beijing. So in Beijing, um, Great Britain as a nation, we won three of six medals available. So it was David Davies who'd won a bronze medal at the Athens Olympics for the 1500, won a silver medal in Beijing for the 10K, I won the silver medal in the 10K and my training partner won the bronze in the 10K. Um, so you could really see that kind of, that was the, the case uh, from, from then on. The um, the two winners though of the 10K at that time were, had an unbelievable amount of experience and they were, you know, the ones that were winning um, many, many world championships before that. So that was kind of then the next thing was, how it was experience and your experience in doing 10Ks and knowing the tactics of your fellow kind of swimmers, how much of an Im impact was that going to have later on down the line? And it probably wasn't until about 2014 that the speed element became a massive part again. So it definitely was still, a, you know, making sure you did have the thousand meter, you know, speed to be mm -hmm. able to hit. So it used to be when you got to the last thousand meters, it was anyone's game. You left everything in the water. Then, then it turned to kind of the last 1200 and then the last 1500 and then the last 2K. And to be honest, it's probably pushing the last 3K now that you're pushing, you know, for, for females, it's well under that 65 mark, um, re that region for 3K, which is mm -hmm. a huge amount of effort to have to put in. And that's why no one really wants to lead anymore because you know that the last 3000 meters or two, 3000 meters is gonna be really fast so you want to try and conserve as much energy as possible for the last two three hundred meters if it's going to be you know a photo finish which it's incredible how many times it is a photo finish two hours of swimming and it comes down to a photo finish at the end is, is amazing and like like zeros hundreds of a second and um, you either win or lose by in these in these swims 
So um, yeah, that's, I was watching yeah. a couple of your world title wins just uh, before we got on here. They, they had some video of it, and then you were just you know like a body length ahead, basically just just touch touch type thing. So it's it was incredible to me just watching those races that you know there's a small pack of women coming down to the end of a 10k, and it's just who's the fastest in the last hundred type thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and that still is definitely the case now. Um, it's just that how fast that transition from kind of being an okay pace to being fast changes. And I think the only way that's going to go is even earlier and even earlier. Um, so that's going to be an interesting one to kind of navigate that that world now and just, you know, I guess at some point needs to come back to that endurance versus speed bit. Um, you know, if you're going to be doing 5K at 65 pace for a female, that's going to take a lot of training under your belt to get used to what that feels like to be able to maintain that as well as another 5k a little bit slower on top of that so i think it's going to be a really interesting couple of olympic cycles to see where it gets pushed out to um but having said that the event is quite young in terms of its infancy mm. you know yeah. it might still change yet we don't really know they might be introducing you know there might be a i know there's a push to introduce some of the um the team events into it as well and that's going to be an interesting one as to where you know how that how that works is the the team events would be male and female mix which obviously had great success in the pool competitions that we've seen and, and i think it would be just as successful in the open water category because it's already introduced into the world championship program and it's really exciting um so yeah that's going to be i think you know who knows which way that's going to go over the next few years and there might be a few more rule changes um yeah depending on how, how, how it works and how, you know, how the new FINA reform and all that kind of stuff, you know, what happens there? Do they look at rules and changing rules and all that kind of stuff? Because I'm sure, you know, like I said, it, it's technically not meant to be a, um, a uh, contact sport. If you, if you do swim into someone, there's the same system as well, what we call soccer, but a football system in the UK, which is you get a yellow card, two yellow cards, and it's a straight red. And if you get a red, you're disqualified and you have to get out straight away. Um, so there are those rules and it does mean that there's referees watching. Um, but sometimes the boats have to get really close. And if the boats are quite close, it it makes people either, you know, keeps people in. So the one thing I would say from the, um, the Rio Olympic Games, which was for me an absolute dream come true, swimming in Rio, we were out to sea, which I absolutely love. Um, it should have been a race all about who has the best sighting who has the best all round open water skills, wavy, all sorts of stuff. But the boats kept us so close that they basically kept us in the channel. Mm. Um, and when anybody went off course, the boats kind of brought them back in, which for wow. me, really unfair, because the whole point of it was that you were right. good at a straight line or seeing where you were going or not. And if you weren't, it's your own fault. Um, that's part of the tactics that you need to learn. But so that's an interesting one. Like the obviously we want the refereeing there, but to what extent is it going to impact the actual outcome of the race? I guess we don't really know that. Right. There's all sorts of um, technologies these days, and I'm sure that there might even be some kind of communication devices. Are they legal to put in your ear to, to talk to somebody? No, no, they're not. They're not at, at the moment. Anyway, they're not. They're not legal. But maybe you know there is like a buzzing system that they can put in, and if you're buzzed you know you've got a yellow card or something like that so the boats can kind of take a bit of a step back yeah yeah um well i was watching your like i said watching your race in in 11 at the world championships when you kind of swam in and then did, did the little just like i just won the world title i love that that was cool but um i also swam at a home olympics in in sydney and then you have your home olympics coming up in in london the following year you're the defending world champion so i'm sure there's a lot of expectation and pressure you ended up finishing fourth in that race so how how did you feel about that whole experience in, in London? London, still to this day, was the most incredible experience I have ever had at Olympics. London, I'm probably biased, but London did an awesome job <laughs> of hosting an Olympic Games. It was amazing. And as a home athlete, I, I now know what rock stars feel like because everywhere you went, if anyone got a sniff that you were a home Olympian, it didn't mm. matter you know, if you were maybe going to win a medal or not, like mm. the support was just incredible. Yeah. The city, London was just amazing as well. The atmosphere, I know we'd laugh about it and joke about it, but people were talking on the tube. That does not happen. <laughs> it really does not happen. Um, yeah. So kind of there's this real amazing atmosphere everywhere you went. And yes, I was double world champion, Olympic silver medalist, um, the favorite by far coming in. Um, my face was pretty much plastered 
everywhere around London. I was the face of the Olympic program that day. Mm. And thankfully, I didn't see that until after my swim. Um, but I'd worked really hard with the psychologist and with my team and everyone that, that you know, were, was a sponsor of mine at the time to, to make sure I didn't feel that external pressure because pressure really is something that you feel internally. Mm. No one else can really put that on unless someone says, you know, I'm putting the pressure on you. Um, but we worked really hard and, and everyone, it was more of a support journey rather than kind of, you know, here's your, you know, bonus if you win a medal. I, I wasn't interested in, in that stuff. It was more about the journey and the support and all that kind of stuff that came along with that. So I worked really hard on that not being a factor. Um, and I, in, in the lead up to that year, to 2012 training program, was decent and i wish i could say it was amazing but it wasn't i had a kidney infection i had a back injury but these things happen you know that's mm -hmm. the life of being an athlete um yep. it was at the end of some you know four incredible years of training double world champion all that kind of stuff on top of that and it just caught up on me that year um there was a little bit of kind of you know my coach got ill before the the olympic trials and it, it was a long journey for him to get back into it so that was different so lots of different bits and pieces but again i'd worked really hard on being ready and i did when i was standing on the pontoon i felt ready i didn't feel like i could have done any more than i had done yeah i was really confident in my my preparation and um all i can say about the race itself was i just made a rookie error my own complete issue my own error made a rookie error halfway through the swim so it was um, in the Serpentine, which is a really small venue. So instead of it being normally four laps of two and a half K, it was six laps of 1.6 K. So mm. lots of things to navigate. The turns had gone from one, two, three, four turns to like six turns times mm. six. Lots of opportunities for things to go wrong. And I had made the, the tactical plan that I wanted to, if anybody was gonna swim next to me, I wanted to be on the inside. So I wanted to make sure I had the best racing line at any point because those turns were incredibly important, especially down the last two laps. Yep. Um, but the the girl that eventually won, she was the one that swam next to me the whole way through the swim. Now, I don't know whether she did this on purpose or not, and I can't really say for sure, but um, I, I didn't have that open back suit that I normally would have had, and I needed to get into the feeding station. And I, again, like I said, I don't know whether she did this on purpose or not, but she just I just couldn't get past her to get into the feeding station. I eventually found an opportunity to go into the feeding station on the third lap, which was two laps too, well, at least one lap too late from, from what my strategy was. Um, so that was the first issue was that was my strategy and I hadn't really planned anything else. So again, mm -hmm. that was my error. The next thing though, was that the feeding, the, the pole, the fishing rod, if you like, was just a tiny bit too high and I just missed the, missed it. So I had to kind of put the brakes on and come back and mm. then grab and because I was just off and everyone else wasn't, I was then basically swam over by everyone, which happens. Again, I was the one mm. in the way. I was the one that had to go back. I was one that was taking a bit longer and everyone was just keen to drink and go. So having gone into the, the, the feeding station joint first, I came out about 12. Mm. And I just remember in that moment being angry. I was so angry, but I wasn't angry with anyone other than myself. I was like, you, idiot this is the biggest competition of your whole entire life how have you managed to find yourself in this situation um because again i found myself in the middle of the pack which is where i did not want to be and that's why after london i worked on you know that judo lesson and seeing what it felt like to be part of a pack and it was just naivety really i thought i'd be able to get away with it again um but i didn't and i ended up managing to make my way back up the pack and finish fourth by 0.4 of a second um I'm not going to lie, it's devastating, like mm. really, really, really hard. And it's amazing, you know, with social media and stuff, you only really remember the bad things that people say, not, not you know, the hundreds and thousands of amazing messages I got. Um, I still remember the three or four bad ones that people posted um, or bad articles on the day. But it, it was, you know, when I look back now, I'm really proud of that swim. And for me, I'm really proud of it because Four years previous to that was the Beijing Olympics. No one knew what 10K was. No one knew what open water swimming was really. But as a result of that, and the fact there was a home Olympics and there was a, an Olympian, a home Olympian and a home Olympics, there were 30,000 people standing around Hyde Park watching me swim. It, it's, it, that's, that was unheard of for an event like that. Um, and still to this day, I get people sending me messages from around the world saying, because I watched that swim that day, 
I took up open water swimming. You inspired me to take up open water swimming. And that for me, that's my legacy. My legacy isn't winning medals. And the fact that I didn't win a medal and I'm still getting people messaging me saying, I watched your swim, it inspired me to take up open water swimming and it wasn't you know, medal orientated. I guess it's like a um, bittersweet in a way. So it's sweet because so many people are doing the sport that I love, but I will always be heartbroken about the result of that race because I really felt like I deserved more, but it was it was all my own fault. Destro Swim Towers. Gain strength in the water with a tower of power. Save $150 per double swim tower by using code BRETT, B-R-E-T-T, -T, at checkout. DestroMachines.com. Vasa has been the go-to training tool outside of the pool for over 30 years. Vasa's products are ideal for developing power and proper technique in your swimmer's catch. Add a few Vasa trainers to your pool deck and it's like adding an extra lane to your swimming pool. Go to VasaTrainer.com, use code BREAD at checkout and get 10% off anything from Vasa. Well, really interesting. Um, I love the analysis. And I love the open honesty when it comes to that and, and taking responsibility for your own actions. I mean, there there are so many things in a season where you look back and you're like, that could have been better, that could have been better. But it is what it is. As athletes, you know, you, you take it season by season and, and you have your ups and downs. But um, with that race too, it sounds like, it sounds like, you know, in terms of turning the anger internally on yourself it may have even been better to turn it on your opponents at that point in time and just yeah. start rip, ripping people apart but um but yeah i mean that's the way it goes i mean that's racing sometimes you look back and you're like i wish i should have done this i should have done that but just didn't eventuate so it's um but, it, but again losing by 0.4 of a second to a medal is you know i've been i've lost by a hundredth of a second before actually that that medal back there that commonwealth medal was a hundredth of a second that's a silver medal and, and that still haunts me like god if i could just been a hundredth better but um it, it it was the race that was the race as you it went that way but um you and i are, are both now part of a, a new app which is pretty exciting a lot of swimming experts are on this app a lot of great coaches a lot of great swimmers you're one of the first open water swimmers it's an app called any question and um, people can um, ask some follow-up questions based on this podcast or anything they have um, in terms of open water. So we can go to uh, anyquestion.com slash, what's your uh, handle on that one? I think it's just Carrie Ann Payne, I think. Carrie Ann Payne. Okay. So go anyquestion.com slash Carrie Ann Payne. <laughs> And um, and get on there and ask her, ask us some follow up questions. I've learned so much in terms of open water just from this, but I'm sure there's more to learn. And and you're really good. I've, I've listened to a lot of your answers on there. And um, how are you how are you enjoying it so far? Great. Yeah, it's really good. There's I mean, there's some questions on there that I probably won't answer because I I'm not the expert in sprinting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not. I'm going to put my hand up and say I'm not. I can probably talk you through an answer for how you can yeah. get better. Um, at 100 freestyle and you know i think it would be a good enough answer but i know that there'll be other people on there other experts that'll be much better to answer those questions but the questions i will answer will be the ones that you know i genuinely think i can give you some insight into um from a coaching open water perspective and and i hope that you'll you know watch some of them and and see something from a different perspective i'm very big on thinking outside the box and you know just because something's been done that way for so long does not mean that's the best way to do it and yeah. um, a real issue <laughs> with the learn to swim programs and not because they're not doing a good job because they are i just really think that they need to be re-looked at and we need to change some of the information that's in them because what i see now as a coach is i'm having to undo so much bad mm bad but just like stuff that's so outdated mm -hmm. um so if there is anything technical from a front crawl perspective you might hear some things that are different and new um that you might not necessarily have considered before or just a slight different angle to think about it from and um, that's really what i'm all about yeah we'll get on there and ask carrie Ann some specific follow-up questions based on what you've heard today or any questions you have especially with open water and freestyle and, and that sort of thing. Maybe the Olympics or ex Olympic experience, um, race strategies, get on there and ask questions. Uh, but anyway, listen, I appreciate this. Thank you for doing it and um, have a great day. And uh, what's your daughter's name, by the way? Here's Josephine just coming to say hello. You gonna say hello? I wanna have crisps. You wanna have some crisps? There you go. That's some really good uh, parenting. Listen, I'm, with you. I'm with you. Let's, let's all go have some crisps. All right, take care. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much for having me. All right, bye.